how beautiful it is when you hear um, one piece of music strike another piece of music. It's like two notes, and I've, I've, I've likened it to the only thing I can think of on planet Earth that, that is analogous, that is a good analogy, a good representation of who God is. As, as you know, you hear two notes strike against each other, and you're just like, ugh, that's just not quite right. But when two notes, you can actually, that harmony, that beautiful harmony, I think we just talked about a whole bunch of harmony and shalom in this next sermon series that we've been looking at. We've been looking at how do we find it? How do we find that harmony? How do we find that shalom and that peace? Well, thankfully, we have an opportunity now to take a look at our Bibles, and so I'll invite you to open up your text if you brought your Bible with you this morning. We're in Matthew chapter 6, smack dab in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, a really good um, sermon of Jesus that's a few pages long, um, and so we're right in the middle there, so you know it's good stuff. Uh, so Matthew chapter 6, we're going to start at verse 5 there. I'm going to invite you to open up your text. You brought your electronic Bible. Those of you online, open it up in a, in a separate tab there or something like that. We're, this morning, we're talking about prayer, and we've been going through, and I want you to, uh, for my writing down folks, this is a good uh, sermon series for you. You have lots of notes, especially on a day like today. Um, if you're going to write something down, first maybe start with Richard Foster. Richard Foster is the um, 80-some-year-old uh, gentleman who, uh, from a Quaker background who wrote um, this book some 30 years ago called The Celebration of Discipline. And it's a book that was formative for myself and Pastor Nicole as we went through seminary together, uh, that we learned about this book and many people have as well over the years. And so I'd en encourage you that if you're interested in knowing more about this book, let us know. Contact the church office or uh, drop us some information on uh, social media and we'd love to get you connected with this book. Uh, there's online resources and stuff like that available too. But Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster is maybe one of the first things you can write down. It'll help you as a companion guide to what it is we're trying to do together. Because one of the questions as we got from meditation to prayer, prayer might be easy. You say, well, I know how to pray. But we're looking at the practice, the actual practical side of things, and I think I, think I was reminded this past fall as I, as I sat around the table with my family and we're about to say a blessing over the meal. And you realize, as you ask the question, well, who's going to lead us in prayer? It dawned on me, unless we give some instruction to our children, maybe even some words to say, some, some terms to use about prayer, they won't be able to do it. So how do we teach prayer? And so we discovered that we have to model it. So we discovered that as adults, those who have gone before, mother and father, and grandmother around the table, we would lead in prayer. And shortly after that, some... Others took turns in praying too. They were shorter prayers, maybe. Some were very creative. I'm sure you can imagine who from. But they were all prayer. It may not be the word perfect Lord's Prayer that we're about to read. But what we will discover today, it's more a matter of our posture before God then it really is about our words. It's a matter of tuning into his channel in order that we may grow in relationship with him. If you'll bow your heads with me, I'd like to pray over the reading of this text. Let's pray. Come, Holy Ghost, our souls inspire. Fill us with your celestial fire, for, Lord, if you are with us, then nothing else matters. And if you are not with us, then nothing else matters. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 6, starting at verse 5, reading to verse 15. <clears throat> this is Jesus speaking. I know that because it's in red in my Bible. <clears throat> and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogue and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not 
keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So why is it important for Jesus to teach his disciples how to pray? I mean, you would imagine that they would have had that figured out at least by now. I think some of the disciples had a tough time knowing what to say maybe after Calvary, after the cross had come and Jesus had died. You know, as we look at this job description, it's not, it's not any wonder that we all need to remind ourselves maybe of some of the words or content that goes into something like prayer. So we're asking a guy like Foster in his celebration of discipline who draws, he, he draws from many historic great prayers Maybe that's all we need, you know, just to know one great prayer. William Blake tells us that our task in life is to learn to bear God's beams of love. When we pray, God slowly and graciously reveals to us our evasive actions and sets us free from them. Prayer aligns our posture for relationship. And here we have the disciples and a lot of these other folks listening to Jesus preach about prayer. This Sermon on the Mount is an important one. It's well known. But they knew about prayer, certainly. They'd even prayed before, often, as Jews do. And growing up, as young Hebrews, they would have prayed in the morning and at night before bed. What had come? Now that, what had changed now that the Messiah had come? They knew this Jesus. It's almost as if no one was paying attention. And I, I do wonder if anyone was listening at all. <laughs> well, let me, let me explain. Um, we just read Matthew. This is what's written in Luke. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive our sins, and we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. That's it. A little different. No Father who art in heaven. It's shorter overall. Has much the same, but but not even the same words. The, The word one sticks out to me. The word for daily, beside the word bread, give us today our daily bread. Matthew and Luke, they record it differently. They agree that it should be bread, but what I've actually learned is that it can be translated tomorrow bread. Give us today our tomorrow bread. There's something in Exodus about that, isn't there? About praying for tomorrow's bread. You know, the whole manna story? And the Israelites are getting greedy, wanting to be sure that tomorrow was fine and safe. I thought that wasn't allowed, but here they are. Even Luke and Matthew can't agree what's what's in the content of prayer. So how long should we pray then? If we can't even get the words right, how long? I like what Foster says in his book. He says, occasional joggers don't win the Olympics. (laughs) That's pretty good. This prayer of Jesus is, is just short enough to be a tweet. It's about the right length. It's, it's also timely and poignant. But he points to the, the fact that prayer is not a matter of a destination. It's a matter of a journey, you see. It's a journey we find ourselves all a part of. 
the times when we cry out to God, and sometimes when the words just don't come. Or the words come, but you can't realize for the tears that we are shedding, that we are wishing, that we were praying them instead of just saying them. Prayer confuses us sometimes. Sometimes we say stuff that doesn't even make sense. Anyone ever heard an awkward prayer? So when do we stop praying? Maybe that's the better question, not how long it should be. I bet you get a different answer for that one too. Because you go around some hospital beds today, I bet you a whole bunch of people are telling you, please don't stop. Don't stop today. Don't stop yet. One lady came to her pastor and said, you know, pastor, I've been on the prayer list for my back for quite some time now. It's been hurting me and I've been praying and praying and I'd like to be taken off the prayer list. Pastor Willimon says, well, that's wonderful news, right? Something to celebrate, how beautiful it is. You must have received a healing from the Lord. She says, no, no, it's nothing like that. Last night while I was awake in bed again, (laughs) dealing with the pain of my back, it came to me, it dawned on me, really, that as God spoke to me, I realized that maybe this is exactly how God would like me to serve. That I don't need your prayer anymore. This is how God is going to use me. So take me off the prayer list. When to stop praying? Hmm. Who can pray? Oh, man, that's a good one. We get stuck on who can pray, don't we? (laughs) Like the pastor, he does it professionally, doesn't he? She's supposed to do that, you know, that's that's the Monday to Saturday work, isn't it? She's supposed to be in her office praying. Just like last week in meditation. The posture of prayer is a matter of preparation. It's being ready. Because the goal of prayer is relationship. It's not to get what we ask. It's not to fill the prayer bowls of heaven just enough so that they tip over and so the blessings pour out. It's not quite like that. If we just prayed enough, I think that's what gets us confused sometimes about prayer. See, if the aim of prayer, if the goal of prayer is to increase our proximity, our closeness to God, and not just to get what we want, we've realigned what Jesus is teaching us about prayer. Not my will, but yours. Now, before we get too far, I want to take a second and do some amen training. I have heard some slight ones from here and there while I was preaching. Now, some of you think amen is for the end of prayer. When someone says it during a sermon, they don't want the sermon to be over. That's not what it means. (laughs) Amen means truthfully or uh, yes or verily, if you want to go. As, As Paul and John would say, let it be. Some of you will get that on the way home. That was for Gary. So when I'm preaching, or Pastor Nicole is preaching, and you hear an amen, the sermon is not over. What's happening is that someone is agreeing. It's true. Now, it usually starts with them agreeing with themselves. Amen. It's almost silent. Then, every once in a while, their neighbor gets involved. Amen. And then there's some nodding and some looking around just like that. Okay? And then, every once in a while, there's a truth that hits just so so poignantly, so squarely, that they need to tell the pastor about it right away. And they say, amen, just like that. I mean, if it's inside of you, it's got to come out. I think that's what Don was telling us about. If you got the joy, 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 joy down in your heart, you got to tell your face about it. I want to warn you about prayer. No prayer that Jesus ever speaks ends with, if it be your will. (laughs) There is something assumed about the will of God and knowing about it for those who follow him. That there are things that we do not know. But yet what we seek is a closeness to him whom we trust. For the disciples, perhaps they knew that even better. 
They knew the will of, of God as it came to them directly from the mouth of Jesus, especially in a long sermon like this, amen, and followed it with these questions about prayer, about how to live. And Jesus has to remind them, ask and you shall receive. Knock and the door will be open. And he says later in the sermon, he kind, he's trying to remind them, pray. But is it a lack of faith? Is it a lack of trust? It is a lack of knowing what leads to our lack of frequency of this practice. Why, why do we not pray Let's be honest, that's, that's our real question, isn't it? It's not just, why don't we pray? It's, why is God not answering my prayer? I mean, we offer them. We may not be on our knees on a prayer mat at 6 o'clock in the morning or in public places crying out and wailing out in the streets, but... Everyone prays. Ask anyone on an airplane incur, uh, incurring some sort of an issue. Sir, ma'am, do you know how to pray? Well, I'll figure it out pretty quick. Our trouble is not hearing from God. That's part of our difficulty. It's the other side, the, the part of last week we talked about, the meditation. I think that's why Foster even starts with meditation. It's why we hear about meditation first. Is that... Sometimes God's trying to speak through our end of the telephone, but he can't get it a word in edgewise. Now, we do get ourselves in a little bit of difficulty because at 3 o'clock in the morning, it's a lonely and an, lonely and an isolated place. And when you feel like God is not picking up, it's really easy to say amen and hit the pillow. But there's something we can learn about the frequency of God. I'm using that, that term. The frequency is what made me think of a radio. See, a radio station dial only works if you've got it tuned to the correct frequency, right? And I think this is why prayer and meditation have to go hand in hand. They are two parts of the communication with God Almighty. But many times we speak first when we should listen. Foster puts them in the right order. You know, my mama used to say, we got two ears and one mouth, right? Are you listening to what God is calling you to pray for? Maybe it's the content of our prayers that need some direction. And so we tune ourselves to the posture of readiness. The lines are open. For what? For God to draw us closer to him. All right, so I said the word frequency. So how frequently should we be doing this praying? Because if you were here last week, I said, and on the law of the Lord, I meditate day and night. That doesn't leave a whole bunch of time for praying. I can't meditate day and night and pray without ceasing, Paul. Which do you want, God? It doesn't mean that you pray continually. It doesn't mean that you don't ever stop, that there's no amen in your, in your vocabulary. It means that you're always ready to pray. It's that posture. It means that when God is speaking, you're able to respond. It's that posture of prayer that allows the prayer to be on the edge of our lips at, a, at any moment's notice. Like this morning, meeting in the prayer room when in having a quick conversation with someone says, I'm, I'm going to pray with you for a second. I'm just going to pray. There's a, a book out there by a guy named Claire de Graff. It's called The Ten Second Rule. It introduces a concept and it says when you feel the tug to do something, and he, he talks about the Holy Spirit being that tug, to do something, to say something, to pray for someone, do it within the next ten seconds or you probably will never do it. Okay, that's the entirety of his book. I just saved you 20 bucks. <laughs> Sorry, Claire. But we have a tendency to overcomplicate something like prayer. We can make it the pastor's job. I remember once visiting with a couple, and we were about to sit down to a meal, and I, I used it as an opportunity to circumvent the, the, 
inevitable request for me to pray and to invite somebody else to pray. And so I took the chance to invite the hostess of the evening to pray. Her husband was a well-respected elder in the church, a vocal leader. He had read sermons, always in, you know, presenting at congregational meetings. She was often quiet, supportive, played in the uh, background role. But around her, a room grew silent, making room for this prayer, the most beautiful prayer. And the whole room knew what she did in the midst of clanging pots and pans or minding children or doing her work. She prayed. She spoke with God as if he were a close friend and not a stranger. That's who can pray. He calls us friend. Did you hear that in that one song that we sang together? He is our comforter and friend. But we complicate prayer because we can sometimes lean too heavily on the words. And so to, to escape that, I want to give you a couple of brief little gifts. One is when you're unsure, how, how do I pray? How do I write a prayer? I'm being asked to do something. Maybe your faith has gotten you in a situation at, uh, at, at work where someone says, will you pray for me? And you say, well, how am I going to pray? I want you to remember something, okay? I'll give you two Two things to remember. One is ACTS, A-C-T-S, okay? And with the ACTS of prayer, what, you, what you're doing is you're basically using those four words as a prompt to craft a prayer. First, we adore God. We thank God for who he is. We recognize him for what he's capable of. Then we confess. That's the C. We confess that we are incapable of doing many of the things that we are about to ask him to help us with. And because we're incapable, T, we are thankful to God. And we express our thanks to him. And then our S, the acts of prayer, the S, is that we ask for him to supply our needs. We adore him. We confess to him. We thank him. We ask him to fill our supply. Those are the acts of prayer. And so in the simplest of, of, of times or moments when you're saying, oh, how am I going to pray? Or I'm being asked to lead this prayer at a, at a meeting or something like this. Remember the acts of prayer. If that's not for you, perhaps um, maybe this one will help. It's called a collect prayer. And, and I think um, it, that's an old word uh, going back to the second and third century, this idea of prayers written in Latin in the collect style. I like to think of prayers like a conversation with God, you know what I mean, like pick up the phone. So I think of, uh, of like a, um, not a collect prayer, but a collect prayer. Like when you call and collect, will you accept the charges? Yes, I will accept the charges. Yeah, one of those prayers, a collect prayer. A praises God for who he is and says, God, we honor and thank you for who you are. You're an amazing God. And we ask by the power of your spirit to come and do this one thing for us, so that we may praise you, so that we may, so that we may, in response to what we are trusting you to do, we will do this. Thanks be to God. That's a colic prayer. Simple enough too, right? Praising God for who he is. By your power give us strength so that we may do this. Thanks be to God. Easy enough. We should be bustling with prayers around here. I want you to, to, um, to remember that prayer changes things. Because prayer starts with a change of us. It's true that as you become a praying person, you find yourselves growing in the humility that God himself desires for us to be drawn to, the humility of Christ, really, the submission that is talked about so often in the New Testament and misused to misunderstand our relationships is designed to help us interrelate. But prayer changes our attitude. It changes our posture so that our relationships can grow. Prayer changes me. But prayer also, I want you to listen for a second, prayer changes God. And what I mean by that, I'm not saying that God is a changeable uh, being, that's not what I'm saying, is that we have evidence in the Bible a couple of times I can think of where uh, Jonah 
has come to God, or Moses has come to God and plead with God, or Abraham's come to God and plead with God, and God hears their prayer and responds as if a change has been dynamically made and said, your prayer matters, that's what God is doing. He's saying to Abraham, to Moses, to Jonah, your prayer I have heard, I see you, I hear you, and your prayer matters. That's what's happening in those moments. Prayer changes us, prayer changes God in that it prepares us to better understand our relationship with him. Not only that, prayer also changes others. It makes a difference in this world around us. I have a friend who works with uh, emotionally handicapped children, people who, um, in a public system, and decided that surreptitiously, unbeknownst to anyone, sneakily, I guess, um, he wanted to pray for these children. And so he didn't tell the children, didn't tell uh, families what he was doing because he was doing it silently and to himself. This is another thing about prayer. It can be a, a personal um, and a, a, an individual one of these disciplines as opposed to a communal discipline. As we get a few weeks on, we're going to find that some of them involve other people. Prayer doesn't need that. This teacher friend would take a child and as they were interacting with their work, he would take them and pray over them and with them. They pray that the resurrected Christ would heal and hurt any of that self-hate within that little boy or that little girl. And so as not to embarrass them, the teacher would walk around the room doing regular duties, praying for that child. And after a while, the child would relax and be able to find themselves back to their seat. Sometimes he would ask um, the child if they remembered what it was like to win a race. The little boy would say, yeah, yeah. And would encourage him uh, this picture of him crossing a finish line and all of his friends cheering him on and loving him. And that way that this child was able to participate in this little prayer uh, project to reinforce his acceptance in a way that he had never imagined possible. It's funny, because by the end of that school year, every child but two were able to return to regular classrooms. Some will say it's coincidence, but uh, I think I'm with the Archbishop William Temple who says that um, I find that coincidences occur much more frequently when I pray. I heard you. Do you want some circumstances to change in your life? Let us pray. If you want to hear more from God, then pray. If any among you is afflicted, says James, let them pray. Maybe you don't know how to pray. Maybe you've never thought about it. But prayer really is the first step of creating that relationship with God. And I think it's the reason that Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray. Because God desires a relationship with us but he knows that we are separate from him. And it's our sin that separates us. It's our lack of faith. But by the power of his spirit, he was willing to to grant us that gift of faith because he is a relational God and he, he relates just like we do. He wants to hear from you. You want evidence? Go back to the beginning. Beginning of Genesis, he wanted to walk and talk with Adam and Eve. We messed it up. And when sin entered the picture, we became separated. We became cut off from God. We became out of tune with his frequency. Prayer allows us to deepen that relationship, to allow ourselves to just tune in that dial. And prayer is a way to thank him for that gift of salvation. Prayer is where we yell or sob or silently wait. Prayer contains the gift of forgive us our debts. I love that part. I love that part when we speak the Lord's Prayer in public together. 
And you have all these different backgrounds and all these different people. I say, you say debts and debtors, I say trespasses. You get debts and debtors and trespasses and trespasses all over, all over each other. I love it. It's a reminder of the crashing together of my own prayer life. It's a reminder that we should pray together more frequently. Can I ask you for a prayer request? Will you pray that I remember to pray? (laughs) This is a way that not only you can show your love for me and I for you, but our love for God and for each other. And so pray for one another. If we are so willing to do so, God will build his kingdom here. But only upon a sure foundation of prayer. Now, this is a typical time where I might lead you in prayer. But as Connie comes up, will you prepare yourself to pray with her? You can stay in your seat, but you can stay in all manner too every once in a while if you want. And there's a chance, there's just a chance that we may all just grow a little bit closer.